Coming up on One Detroit, we're going to preview the lineup at the 11th annual Free Film Festival. Plus, we'll talk with the filmmaker of the festival's opening night documentary about River Rouge High School's storied basketball program. Also ahead, a preview of a festival documentary about the transformation of Detroit's riverfront. Plus, we'll tell you how you can help Detroit Public Television tell Detroit's story. And we'll have a roundup of things to do this weekend in Metro Detroit. That's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Just ahead on One Detroit, a local filmmaker talks about his documentary focusing on the amazing basketball legacy at River Rouge High School. Plus, we'll have a preview of a new documentary that chronicles the development of Detroit's waterfront. Also coming up, just in time for the NFL Draft, we're sharing stories about what makes Detroit great. And Dave Wagner of 90.9 WRCJ has some ideas on how you can spend the weekend and beyond. But first up, the 11th annual Free Film Festival takes place April 10th through the 14th at various venues here in Metro Detroit. The lineup includes more than 20 feature-length documentaries and dozens of short films, many of which have local connections. I met up with the festival's artistic director and co-founder, Kathy Kalashevsky from the Detroit Free Press, and local filmmaker, Razi Joffrey, at the Detroit Film Theater in the Detroit Institute of Arts. That is the site of the festival's opening night. So let's talk about the Free Film Festival. What should I go see this year? We're in our 11th year, right? And, yeah. you know, our theme has always been Michigan films or films that are relevant and resonate here in Michigan. And every year I am surprised that there are that many important stories that are well produced that are worthy of a big screen like here at the Detroit Film Theater. Yeah. And so, you know, this year most of the films in the main lineup have some sort of Michigan connection, be it opening night with mm -hmm. Rouge, uh -huh. um, which is about the River Rouge high school basketball team, a film called Relentless that looks at the efforts by University of Michigan scientists back in the day to save the, the Great Lakes fishery and particularly from the sea lamprey. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got one about the resurrection of the Detroit Riverfront. So there's I'm a little familiar with that You're one. a little familiar <laughs> with that one. So yes, produced by DPTV. Yeah. And then, you know, things that have uh, strong dotted lines back here, like the never too much, the Luther Vandross docs. And Lu we know Luther has to come to Freep because <laughs> we know he's got a strong fan base here. Yeah, yeah. What about themes uh, this year? What, what are we looking at? Yeah, I'm really excited to um, partner with the Freep again yeah. this year to uh, curate an Asian American um, set of films, yeah. uh, looking at yeah. a spectrum of Asian American experiences from Asian American directors. Um, it's the second year we've done this uh, program, and so we have some really amazing films, you know, both biographical, uh, looking at the contributions in sports and art with uh, Jeanette Lee Verse, mm -hmm. as an ESPN documentary directed by Ursula Lang. We also have the Nam Jun Pak uh, biopic uh, directed by Amanda Kim. We also have an um, incredible um, short films um, program with the theme around labor, uh -huh. uh, both labor that we perform um, in our work and vocations, but also the work that we do in our families to kind of keep things together. Yeah. Um, so so uh, those are some of the films and some of the themes that we're looking at in the AAPI yeah. film series. And talk about why that part of the festival is important, uh, that Asian American Pacific Islander 
kind of subgroup, really. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredibly important. You know, we are very lucky in Southeast Michigan. Yeah. We have a robust um, Asian American community. You know, a I'm growing one. I mean, and and growing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly, you know, in places like Canton mm -hmm. and Troy and, um, of course, Amtramic, you know, as well. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've myself, you know, being of Indian heritage, I've seen the community evolve and grow and become more dynamic and become more engaged in the political process and um, and make contributions across uh, different sectors and um, I think you know we want to be able to reflect that on screen as well and we want people to be able to see themselves and in the stories that we're trying to bring uh, you know here to Detroit mm -hmm. and we also want to try to develop uh, and grow the filmmaking community mm -hmm. and to bring together um, Asian American filmmakers and um, we're very lucky through um, a generous support from the Ford Foundation we're able to um, actually bring all the directors to Michigan and yeah. have uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, connections with them and have them participate in the Q&A's. Not all of them can make it, so you know we'll uh, figure out other ways to incorporate the other filmmakers yeah. too, but yeah. it's an incredible program and I'm glad that we're able to do it again for a second year. Yeah. So, so I can remember, of course, when this all started. Yeah. It was different uh, in the first couple of years, uh, and I, I, I feel like it was harder maybe to, to, to fill out the roster with locally produced uh, films mm -hmm. and now I mean people are beating down your door it seems to get into the festival sometimes <laughs> yeah, yeah um, sometimes. so so what's changed over that over that time in terms of filmmaking here the filmmaking community here uh, do you feel like the festival has had an influence over how much is done how how kind of big or robust the the, the community is I mean, I'd like to think that we yeah. have helped embolden the ecosystem to make films. Um, we've done a lot to bring filmmakers that were maybe previously from the region and have gone on to the coast to mm -hmm. bring them back, mm -hmm. to connect with local filmmakers, um, to continue to um, not only highlight that there's filmmaking being done here, but there is talent here that can be utilized for other projects. You know, we know the parachuting in of journalists was a thing back, you know, particularly during kind of the 2008 and the bankruptcy period. Mm -hmm. um, and the similar thing with filmmakers kind of coming in and telling stories about us. About us, yeah. And so the thought was, no, we want to be the authors of our own stories. Um, but, you know, the visibility, the connections, I mean, getting, you know, um, funding and distribution, all of those things are really kind of targeted towards the, the filmmakers that are more visible on the coast. Yeah. And w I think we've done a good job of saying, no, there's great talent in filmmaking happening here. And you'll see that. I mean, it, particularly we've got, outside the AAPI series, we have three really amazing shorts programs that are chock full of local filmmakers. Yeah. I do think that the festival has given a platform and has also provided support and networking opportunities that have allowed for more filmmaking to, to, to continue to happen. Um, and I do think from from a festival of visibilities, I mean, 11 years is a long time mm -hmm. in, in a festival yeah. lifespan. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we've had films like we have Frida, uh -huh. the, the documentary about Frida Kahlo. I was gonna Frida ask Kahlo. you about that, it's yes. one of my favorites. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful and so well done yeah. um, that maybe in year one or two, uh, I would never have gotten that film. Is that right? Yes, that yeah. that Amazon would have said, you know, I'm not really sure that's worth us really playing this playing small regional, yeah. regional festival. Yeah. And, you know, obviously um, it's connection here to this amazing institution and this museum yeah. and where- I mean, that's, and that's gonna play here yes. at the DFT, yes. which is attached to the, to the museum. And, right, and uh, there'll be some tours, some free tours happening yeah. of the, the industry murals just prior to the screening to kind of tie it all together. But that her time here in Detroit um, is really a part of that story. And yeah. much of it is, well, all of it is really done in the voices of the people through their letters and diaries. And it's just, it's such a personal look at her life and her experiences all, you know, in in her art, artist life, her yeah. life with Diego, her, and her life, you know, both in Mexico and here in the States. Yeah, yeah. So my favorite moment uh, in the festival was the premiere of, uh, of course, Twelfth and Claremont, mm -hmm. which uh, you worked on, yes. and uh, lots of people at the Free Press. Uh, talk about other premieres that, that you've sort of 
clung to and thought were really, really great. Um, that was pretty magical. Yeah. You know, the community's <laughs> response to that film. Yeah. We've had some amazing premieres. Yeah. I mean, you know, The Russian Five, mm -hmm. um, The Story of Cream Magazine, um, you know, last year's Cold Water Kitchen, which is another free press yep. film. Uh -huh. You know, it's really hard to fill <laughs> an 1100 seat theater on a Wednesday night <laughs> right. for a documentary. Right. And, um, and free press, I think it's, you know, we've, we've picked films that we think r are really resonate with audiences. I mean, Rouge is selling really well, but so please, if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, <laughs> go please get go get your right. tickets. We've been really fortunate that there's been so many films that have ha that are of really high quality, that are great Michigan stories. Yeah. Yeah. The Free Film Festival's opening night documentary titled Rouge tells the story of River Rouge High School's amazing basketball legacy. The school holds the most state championships in Michigan history. One Detroit's Bill Kubota spoke with the documentary's director, Amudi Jafar, about how his own love for basketball led him to the incredible story of the River Rouge High School Panthers. The opening night film at the 2024 Free Film Festival, a documentary about a basketball program with a winning history that goes back 70 years. The film, it's called Rouge, as in River Rouge, a small town next to that big city of Detroit. There's 14 state championships on that wall. That's what we play for. This is a fast break drill. This ain't a slow break drill. Rouge, directed by local filmmaker Hamoudi Jafar. How did you come across the story? I grew up in the Downriver area. And when I was growing up in the 90s, you know, I'm a child of immigrants. Basketball was like, it was really a gateway for me, like to, to gain acceptance and friendships. And it, it taught me a lot as a young person. And during that time, River Rouge High School was, in the late 90s, was the best basketball program around. And I was, I looked up to Brent Darby, who was their best player at the time. Brent Darby, we said, is unstoppable with the ball. Brent Darby in the back of Jafar's mind when in 2019 he was working on a short film hoping to profile Ypsilanti High School sensation Imani Bates, who made the cover of Sports Illustrated. And we went to go film Imani Bates and we were denied access to his locker room that night. And by default, ended up in, in his opponent's locker room who was, happened to be River Rouge. In that moment, I realized that the late Brent Darby that I had looked up to when I was a kid, well, that his son was there in that play. locker room that night, which I didn't know. I didn't even know Brent had a son, to be honest. When he died, I was just thinking like, let me, let me do something like that's gonna make him proud or something like that. I realized in that moment, he was playing for his dad's coach. You know, he was, was kind of like, discover this father-son legacy story, essentially. And they went out and won that night and they beat Imani Bates and Ypsilanti Lincoln. So at that point, I just was hooked. You know, I felt like, you know, whatever led me there, led me there. And then I was just consumed. River Rouge, the winner. With Jafar's dive into Rouge basketball came the discovery of the school's storied past. I grew up in the 60s. If you like basketball, you knew three things. Boston Celtics, UCLA, and River Rouge, because they were all the best. It's the gold standard of high school basketball in America. It is the winningest program in the state of Michigan's history. You know, I fell down a rabbit hole of research and discovered like the Lofton Green years of the late 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 70s. The bottom line is who won championships. And nobody has done it like River Rouge has done it. And, and realized it was this, during the segregated times, it was this integrative high school and they had accomplished what no other high school had ever accomplished on, on the hardwoods. Sometimes they say records are meant to be broken. That will never be broken. River Rouge was like one square mile. And that's where all of the players came from. So it, it you know, one of the guys, Bill Kilgore, we interviewed him in the film. And one of the lines he said was when you, in River Rouge, when you're born in River Rouge, you're born with a basketball in your hands. And if you're not born with it in your hands, eventually it, it lands in your hands, you know, by the age of two or three. A warrior, a champion, a Rouge Panther, 
he gonna live on every single game. Rouge basketball history and more revealed within those walls, just across from the high school, an old arena that seems stuck in time. For this film, a backdrop for decades of past athletes to share their memories. Which one we missed? My year, the, 72. Uh, 72, how, what happened to that? I don't know. It must have fell off. It was a typical track town. It was divided by the railroad tracks. From downtown route, you would see white folks. Otherwise, in your neighborhood growing up, we had no white folks on uh, that side of town. Well, there's also a building there, the place that they used to play basketball. That's really kind of this other character in your film. Talk about the Buck. The Buck Gymnasium, it, it's such a, symbolically, it's such a beautiful representation of the entire story for, for all kinds of reasons. He would take the best five from each school, so that would be 20 starting in the eighth grade. 10 white boys, 10 black boys. In 1958, when it opened, I mean, there was no other gymnasium like it. And it was basically, something that you'd see out of like colleges or universities, but they had it on the high school level because of the success they were having, obviously, in the late 40s into the early 50s. We were the first in the state to win the state championship as an all-black school. All-black starting five, you mean? Starting five, yeah. right. Because Paul was with him, but he was still the same color. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the first things that had to be cut from an overhead perspective was, was the buck because of you know, how much it costs to maintain. The rise, the fall, and then there's the program today. The River Rouge Panthers winning again. In Rouge, we meet not just the players, but the support staff too. I'm in awe of the humanity of it. I love every scene that the team managers, Squeak and CJ are in. It offers an extension of how how beautiful everyone's soul is within that community. And, and those two are such a beautiful representation of that because they're so loved and adored by everyone. And, and you feel that every time you see them and feel them interacting with student athletes or the coaches or the parents. Then there's yeah. Coach Lamonte Stone. As a coach, I was gonna get this thing back to a state championship level. Coach by Lamonte Stone. Yesterday's team is extremely strong. They may be the best team in the state, and the Rivers Panthers have their work cut out for them. As you see that guy right there, Lamonte Stone, in his third year, who has done wonders with this Rivers program. You no, know, Lamonte is such a beautiful representation because he was a former student athlete that played for Coach Green, that went on to become the, the program's head coach in the 90s and reinstilled the glory, essentially. And then he went on to coach in college for 15 plus years, you know, after they won back-to-back -back state championships in the late 90s. He also advanced in his coaching career. And that was a big reason why the story made so much sense. You call student athletes, not athlete students, student athletes, the word student come before the athlete. When I connected those dots and realized that Coach Stone was back, coaching at his alma mater, coaching Brent Darby's son, who was his best player, I mean, you can't, I couldn't have scripted that. Even Stone leads the team on the way to another state championship. Playoffs about to start, it's March 2020. Remember what happened then? An outcome no one could have predicted, but well documented here. I think what's so unique about the present day story is it's an extension of a lot of different challenges that communities of color face, especially locally. Inkster High School being one of them, like neighboring communities that lost their high schools. And River Rouge, there's a, there's a story about how they were ordered to have their doors shut down. And they were on the list of schools to be shut down. They were with Inkster. They had to reinvent themselves, you know, to even be able to survive. They obviously became an open enrollment school, but then they extended their bus routes out, you know, an hour, just to be able to bring kids into the school district that needed school, but then obviously to, to increase their own student enrollment. So to me, it's a beautiful representation of, you know, how River Rouge always rises. It's such a resilient place, you can't keep it down, you know, and I think that's obviously a beautiful representation of that.
Another locally themed documentary that's playing at the Free Film Festival on April 13th and 14th is titled Ignore the Noise, the Transformation of the Detroit Riverfront. The film shows how the city's waterfront was transformed from a blighted wasteland into a national award-winning river walk. The story is told through the voices of the people who played a major role in the transformation over the last two decades. The documentary is a collaboration between Detroit Public Television and Free Age Films. Here's a preview. There are a million ways this project could have gotten killed. It didn't have to happen this way, and it is uncommon for a community to be able to pull something like this off. The riverfront was desolate. It was abandoned. It was in total disrepair. Tall piles of cement, burned out buildings, abandoned cars, eroding shoreline. It was not a place where anyone would have any reason for visiting. I grew up in Detroit, and I didn't know we had a riverfront. Uh, unless you went to Belle Isle, you never saw it. This is Detroit. I like to live in this town. My neighbors are people who care. You had the cement silos there. Um, you had aggregate everywhere. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. Detroit. Detroit, my home. It was just real industrial when I started working at the riverfront. At the time, it was kind of like, are we really going to make this a beautiful riverfront? I just, I just couldn't see it. It was just so much work that had to be done. Detroit. It literally means straight or river. So when we talk about our waterfront, the words are as important as the thing itself. The water that flows past our city is our city. And it shapes so much of who we are. You can also see Ignore the Noise here on Detroit Public Television on Monday, April 29th at 9 p.m. Now let's turn to events happening this weekend and beyond in Metro Detroit. There's a great mix of activities available, including arts exhibits, theater productions, concerts, and shopping. Here's Dave Wagner of 90.9 WRCJ with today's One Detroit Weekend. Hi, I'm Dave Wagner with 90.9 WRCJ, ready to fill your calendar for the upcoming weekend. You know, on Friday, you can spend an evening with the great jazz master and three-time Grammy award-winning saxophonist Branford Marcellus. He'll be at Orchestra Hall performing with his quartet, which includes Joey Calderazzo on piano, Eric Rivas on bass, and Justin Faulkner on drums. Now, Saturday, head to the Fisher Theater to see Celtic Woman perform in their 20th anniversary tour. They're going to showcase harmonious traditional Irish music with a contemporary flair. Then on April 6th, 12th, and 14th, the Detroit Opera House presents Breaking the Waves. It's a brand new production focused around a wife whose husband suffers a paralyzing accident. The audience will watch as the wife contemplates just what she will do for love. Sunday marks the 10th year celebration of all things Detroit Day in Eastern Market from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. You can go and peruse over 200 local small businesses represented in sheds 3, 4, and 5, and you're going to find crafts, food, drinks, and so much more. Also, don't miss Detroit Repertory Theater's presentation of Annabella in July. This play follows a couple who takes a trip on their 20th wedding anniversary, and the events that take place once they enter a ski lodge in July shake things up in their relationship. Get ready for some laughs in this fast-paced comedy. Of course, we have so many more events to take part in, so let's check out a few more. Have a fantastic weekend. And finally today, Detroit Public Television is pleased to kick off an initiative called Truly Detroit. As we prepare to welcome the NFL Draft to the city, we want to shine a spotlight on the people, places, and things that make our city and region truly unique. Take a look.
the NFL Draft is coming, and you can help tell the world what is truly Detroit. Join DPTV as we tell the story of the greatest city in America, while the NFL spotlight shines on our region. Tell us what's your truly Detroit, like your favorite Detroit pizza, favorite hangout, or favorite Detroit performer. Then check out our special Truly Detroit archive. Here we have dozens of great stories to share from all of your DPTV favorites. Help Detroit Public TV tell our story to the world as we share what is truly Detroit. This program is made possible in part by Timothy Bogert, Comprehensive Planning Strategies. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.